Greetings, Emmett here from Reading for Wisdom. Now we've got a short little book here to delve in today and it's a little bit of a historical curiosity. And the reason we are featuring it is because it has contemporary relevance. There's quite a bit of timeless wisdom in it, uh, typical of the type of books that we like to highlight uh, on this uh, channel. What is that book and why is it relevant? The book how to Win an Election, An Ancient Guide to Modern Politicians by Quintus Tullius Cicero. Now, a little bit of background about this book, and uh, it is a really cynical read. So who the author was, um, was the younger brother of the great uh, Cicero, uh, Marcus Cicero. And Cicero lived, uh, for those of you not overly familiar with uh, Roman history, Cicero lived in that very, very important crux moment for the old Roman Republic. Uh, he lived from roughly about 104 BC to uh, 43 uh, BC when uh, he was horribly uh, murdered. And in that period, the Roman Republic was, as it was its wont, uh, to be in flux. You had some great figures rampaging uh, around the Republic. Julius Caesar, um, Pompey, some of these great giant names. And effectively what was happening at the time was the Roman Republic was coming under lots and lots of pressure from its own sort of internal um, contradictions, uh, but also from the ambitions of, of great men who wanted to concentrate power in their own hands. Now, it must be said, uh, in the case of a Julius Caesar, uh, often the desire to concentrate power was their perceived way of doing good, of doing good by the empire. But it was so uh, riven by uh, rivalries and civil war. And Cicero, uh, Marcus uh, Cicero, was uh, many, many, many things. He was a great orator. Uh, his uh, voice and his speeches and his speech making were so powerful in the Senate, so powerful in Rome, and his speeches come down to us this day. So he was fantastic orator. He was, of course, a very ambitious politician. And he was an ambitious politician who was very much on the side of the, oh, sort of quasi-oligarchic uh, rule of the Republic. And, of course, the Republic was dominated by the elites. Uh, the Cicero brothers were from the equestrian class. We would call them knights. So they were the sort of second rung down in the uh, social ladder. Uh, so wealthy, powerful um, people, but not quite the uh, total upper crust, the aristocracy. And the um, Cicero's, um, Marcus Cicero, uh, as I've said, you know, really, really great figure. And he's notable for so many things uh, in his time. What is notable about him, of course, is how he uh, came to his end. And that was after the assassination of um, Caesar. And he fell afoul of uh, Mark uh, Antony. And uh, he met his end. Uh, he was put on a, a blacklist. He was a subscribed, a prohibited figure. And he was eventually caught, captured, uh, beheaded, and had his hands cut off and nailed um, on spikes um, in the forum, the Roman forum. And the hands cutting off, of course, was uh, revenge. Uh, a revenge on this man to dis defile his body in such a way because of the power of his writing. So normally head cut off and put on a spike was enough, but no, they had to, to this uh, great, uh, powerful man, showing the power of his argument, his legal arguments against some of the tyrants, uh, was to cut his hands off. Uh, reportedly, also, um, Antony's uh, wife uh, stabbed his tongue uh, with a hairpin uh, numerous times as well, again, as a way to desecrate the great vocal power of this person. Um, 
But stepping back to uh, earlier times uh, before his demise, um, this book uh, was written by his younger brother, uh, Quintus, um, as a campaign guide. And this is where Cicero was going um, to for the role of consul for the first time. And consul was uh, an elected position. And it was an elected position that uh, ruled with another sort of junior consul over the uh, Republic, uh, which was by then uh, quite a large empire, uh, but not an empire in name. Uh, and it was to rule over that for a year. So this um, required you to electioneer, an electioneer to the uh, citizens of Rome who could vote in these um, things. And what uh, Quintus, his brother, does, and Quintus um, is, is a relatively minor figure in, in history, uh, overshadowed, of course, by his great brother. Quintus um, was a political figure himself. He held quite a few posts um, in the Republic as governor of a number of provinces. Uh, it sounds like he was a bit of a, um, a, bit of a disagreeable character by all uh, accounts. But nonetheless, uh, he wrote this book as a, a letter a letter to his uh, brother when he was going for the consulship and what to think about, how to approach campaigning, how to talk to people, how to make promises. And in this letter that we have surviving to this day, uh, which is captured in, in this volume, what we see is written down um, the art of political electioneering. And just about everything in here is so true still to this day. So the value of this book is, is that it gives us uh, an insight into, well, how people behave now and how timeless that is in a democracy. So what we're going to do is, uh, without further ado, is talk through a few little passages from Quintus uh, as he is speaking to his older brother and giving him advice. And the first set of passages that we're going to look at is really about the whole campaigning. How do you go into an election campaign and frame it? And who do you have to deal with to get those votes so you can get into power? Consider that few outsiders have the number and variety of supporters that you do. All those holding public contracts are on your side, as well as most of the business community. The Italian towns also support you. Don't forget about all the people you have successfully defended in court, clients from a wide variety of social backgrounds. And of course, remember the special interest groups that back you. Finally, make good use of the young people who admire you and want to learn from you, in addition to all the faithful friends who are daily at your side. Work to maintain the goodwill of these groups by giving them helpful advice and asking them for their counsel in return. Now is the time to call in all favours. Don't miss an opportunity to remind everyone in your debt that they should repay you with their support. For those who owe you nothing, let them know that their timely help will put you in their debt. And of course, one thing that can greatly help an outsider is the backing of the nobility, particularly those who have served as consuls previously. It is essential that these men, whose company you should wish to join, should think you worthy of them. You must diligently cultivate relationships with these men of privilege. Both you and your friends should work to convince them that you have always been a traditionalist. Never let them think you are a populist. Tell them if you seem to be siding with the common people on any issue, it is because you need to win the favour of Pompey, so that he can use his great influence on your behalf, or at least not against you. Be sure you work to get young men from noble families on your side and keep them there. They can be very helpful to your campaign by making you look good. You already have many supporters among this group, so make sure they know how much you appreciate them. If you can win over even more of them to your side, so much the better. Running for office can be divided into two kinds of activity, securing the support of your friends and winning over the general public. You gain the goodwill of friends through kindness, favours, old connections, 
availability and natural charm. But in an election, you need to think of friendship in broader terms than in everyday life. For a candidate, a friend is anyone who shows you goodwill or seeks out your company. But don't neglect those who are your friends in the traditional sense through family ties or social connection. These you must continue to carefully cultivate. Do not overlook your family and those closely connected with you. Make sure they are all behind you and want you to succeed. This includes your tribe, your neighbours, your clients, your former slaves and even your servants. For almost every destructive rumour that makes its way to the public begins among family and friends. You should work with diligence to secure supporters from a wide variety of backgrounds. Most important among these are men of distinguished reputations, for even if they don't actively back you, they will confer dignity on you by mere association. Work to win over former magistrates, including those who have been consuls, but also tribunes of the people, for this makes you look worthy of holding high office. Make friends with any man who holds great influence among the centuries and the tribes. Their political debts to you if they want you to look favourable on them in the future. Remember also those men who owe you favours because you defended their interests successfully in court. Make it clear to each one under obligation to you exactly what you expect from him. Remind them that you have never asked anything of them before, but now is the time to make good on what they owe you. There are three things that will guarantee votes in an election. Favours, hope and personal attachment. You must work to give these incentives to the right people. You can win uncommitted voters to your side by doing them even small favours. So much more so all those who you have greatly helped who must be made to understand that if they don't support you now, they will lose all public respect. But do go to them in person and let them know that if they back you in this election, you will be in their debt. As for those you have inspired with hope, a zealous and devoted group, you must make them to believe that you will always be there to help them. Let them know that you are grateful for their loyalty and that you are keenly aware of and appreciate what each of them is doing for you. The third class of supporters are those who show goodwill because of a personal attachment they believe they have made with you. Encourage this by adopting your message or adapting your message to fit the particular circumstance of each and showing abundant goodwill to them in return. Show them that more the more they work for you in your election, the closer your bond to them will be. For each of these three groups of supporters, decide how they can help you in your campaign and give attention to each accordingly, reckoning as well how much you can demand from them. Seek out men everywhere who will represent you as if they themselves were running for office. Visit them, talk to them, get to know them. Strengthen their loyalty to you in whatever way works best using the language they understand. They will want to be your friends if they see that you want to be theirs. Small town men and country folk will want to be your friends if you take the trouble to learn their names, but they are not fools. They will only support you if they believe they have something to gain. If so, they will miss no chance to help you. Others, especially your competitors, won't trouble themselves to develop friendships with these sort of people. So if you take the time they can be all the more valuable to you as friends and allies. And develop a superficial friendship. You must actually be their friend. When they believe you are, the leaders of any organization will rally their members to work hard for you since they know what backing you will naturally benefit them as well. Thus, when all your supporters among the towns, neighborhoods, tribes and various groups are working together on your behalf, you should feel very hopeful indeed. So we saw in those passages something that comes straight out of today's playbook. 
I find it a bit frightening that uh, 2,000, over 2,000 years later, politics um, in our democracy still plays by these rules. Interest groups, uh, what sort of sway you have over them, who can help you, who you've got to suck up to. But quite importantly, and I think we see this often in uh, left-wing politics, and we see it particularly with the Green Movement, zealous young people getting them on your side because they will work tirelessly for you if they believe in your cause. And I think uh, this is one of the key uh, sort of lessons that is often forgotten is uh, the need to mobilize supporters, supporters who are really keen and get behind you. And we saw that in campaigns like uh, the Obama campaign in the United States, really successfully galvanizing, getting out that portion of the vote. But of course, there are all the other uh, intrigues uh, and promises as well on the uh, slippery campaign poll. Um, so some very familiar stuff, I'm sure you would agree. Now, one of the interesting things I think um, with uh, Quintus uh, in his advice to his brother is on the role of hmm, lying, I think it would be fair to call it. Um, so the giving of promises or the not giving of promises and what you say on the campaign trail and what it actually means once you get into elected office. And he has some great insights. Let's uh, look at it in this final set of passages. I am telling you what you need to hear as a candidate for public office. If you refuse a man by making up some tale about a personal commitment to a friend, he can walk away without being angry at you. But if you say you're just too busy, or have more important things to do, he will hate you. People would prefer you to give them a gracious lie than an outright refusal. Remember Cotta, that master of campaigning, who said that he would promise everything to anyone unless some clear obligation prevented him, but only lived up to those promises that benefited him. He seldom refused anyone, for he said that often a person he made a promise to would end up not needing him, or that he himself would have more time available than he thought he would have to help. After all, if a politician made only promises he was sure he could keep, he wouldn't have many friends. Events are always happening that you didn't expect, or not happening that you did expect. Broken promises are often lost in a cloud of changing circumstances so that anger against you will be minimal. If you break a promise, the outcome is uncertain, and the number of people affected is small. But if you refuse to make a promise, the result is certain, and it produces immediate anger in a larger number of voters. Most of those who ask for your help will never actually need it. Thus, it is better to have a few people in the forum disappointed when you let them down, than to have a mob outside your home when you refuse to promise them what they want. People will, by nature, be much angrier with a man who has turned them down outright than with someone who is backed out of his obligation, claiming that he would love to help them only if he could. So there we go. That is the art of politics. And um, again, uh, 2000 years later, hmm, what has changed? And very, very wise uh, advice for the uh, campaigning or the aspiring politician. You know, promise everything. And, uh, of course, you can make all sorts of excuses uh, when you actually get into power. Well, yes, we would have done this, but we found there's actually no money to do it. Or, well, yes, we actually did promise this and we will do it next year. Or if we win the next election or the next one. Or, yes, we're going to put this into the budget now for five years time. So these are things that we just see all the time with politics and we see a, a sort of a cynicism. We're, we're very suspicious as people of politicians, but you can see here that it has been ever thus so. Um, so look, I really recommend this uh, little book and it'll be particularly instructive uh, reading 
as we all go through various different election campaigns. So there are, uh, in my country, uh, there's an election campaign uh, about to kick off. Uh, of course, in the United States, which dominates um, so much of the coverage and even our thought about elections and campaigning and electioneering, um, there is almost a perpetual campaign going on, but a, a big one about to kick off there as well. And look, I don't know that uh, any of those uh, big politicians, those big political beasties need to read this. They understand everything uh, that's in here, uh, where this is most insightful for us, I think, uh, for the citizen, for the voter. Read this and go, ah, I know where he's coming from now. Hmm, I know why she says things the way she says them. Hmm, I know why that campaign is being run in that way. I know why all of a sudden I seem to be so important to those politicians. So look, wonderful cynical work. And uh, Philip Freeman, who has uh, translated and given us a bit of an introduction in here, has done a sterling job. Look, little thin work. Uh, you'll read this in an evening, but its power will last you so much longer. And um, what we're going to do in the links below is, is give you some uh, guidance on where you can learn more about Cicero, uh, the tragedy of the Cicero family, the magnificent uh, legacy they have left us. So, hope you enjoyed uh, this week's uh, episode of uh, Reading uh, for Wisdom and a very topical study I think you'll find. Uh, please, if you like the type of content we're given, uh, make some comments below. Um, um, maybe request uh, some things you'd uh, like me to look at, whether it be topics, particular books or particular authors. Uh, please give us a like. As always, do subscribe to our channel. Thanks to all our current uh, subscribers and supporters. And we'll see you next time. Keep wise.